can you hear morning thank you uh, my name is arun i am the founder and ceo of strides group i'm delighted that you could make it today for this uh, investor presentation and update of uh, q4 and also the recent uh, transaction announcements uh, i'll appreciate if you can just set some ground rules here we typically don't allow mobile phones at all so we'll appreciate if they either switched off or on silent if you must take a call please step out because we have a live webcast uh, so it, we had we have serious issues with recording quality if we continue to use mobile phones uh, questions must be asked only using a, a, a speaker phone which will be handed over uh, we had difficulties last time when most of your questions were not audible for our international investors so we much much appreciate if we can agree on these simple ground rules before we start thank you i also have pleasure in introducing you uh, to my colleagues uh, i have uh, badri who is our group cfo uh, my partner previously in ascent uh, before we sold that business a couple of years ago and now uh, a new newly acquired business in australia uh, dennis will be leading that business uh, we're very delighted that he could be here and andrew burgess who was uh, also a cfo in, in ascent uh, and now with this new acquisition in australia uh, andrew and dennis would be the senior leadership team and i thought this would be a good opportunity for for all of you to understand the the australian market and why we get so excited uh, being down under so uh, it'll be a great opportunity uh, for all of you to interact with dennis and andrew and they'll take you through a presentation uh, of the business in terms of an agenda we have uh, a quick update on our q4 results which we announced on friday uh, followed by the transaction overview uh, we have an update on the sashun merger uh, and then we leave it to dennis and andrew to take you through questions uh, through the transaction itself and questions around it and then i'll summarize uh, where we are uh, from where we started 12 months ago and where we are today thank you so um So I like to believe that this year has been a extremely good year for Strides. Uh, we've achieved both critical scale and size. Uh, most pleasing to me is the quality of the business. The quality of the business has shifted uh, from a B2B business, as you probably know, when, when we sold Agila to Mylan, predominantly our business was a B2B business. We have moved that to a B2C business. we are front ended in almost 90% of our businesses we do not do partnerships we do not do co licensing and stuff like that um the generics business uh, we achieved a, a significantly higher uh, brand brand mix compared to generics and apart from being debt free we also use working capital but we see very significant improvements in our optimization of working capital a stand alone strides business uh, except for a co pharmaceutical business hardly uses or is working on no working capital or negative working capital uh, profitability has been the focus uh, the last 12 months when we sold our business to mylan uh, we actually had a very small business suboptimal business which is about 150 odd million dollars and our focus was not about top line growth it was about the quality so while top line was flat and that was by design and not by default uh, we were very pleased with the ebitda growth of over 400% basis points 400 basis points sorry and it is across businesses and we can take you through that every single business of ours is has become more profitable than what it was before and with very efficient oversight and financial discipline and led by badri and his team we very pleased with the fact that we were able to not only have a high conversion of ebitda to cash but also a high conversion from ebitda to pat which is which again is for strides maybe a a very big step up in terms of how we run our businesses consistency uh, has been the hallmark of the last 12 months every single quarter we moved a notch up from the previous quarter and that's been very important for us Uh, and that consistency gives us forecast reliability it gives us supply chain efficiencies working capital improvements and stuff like that so 
if you look at uh, the accelerated EBITDA run, it grew from what we started off in Q1 of last financial year and what we exited in Q4. Our EBITDA growth has been 40%, uh, while our revenue growth has been only 7%. So Q1 to from 54 crores to 74 crores in the quarter, we grew 40% in, in 12 months. Size, uh, we did some corporate actions where we would address size. Some of it was small, some of it were transformational, some of them would be disruptive. And we announced uh, the global rights acquisition of Radicam, um, which is the business of Bafna Pharmaceuticals, which in turn acquired this from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, I'm very pleased that not only have we uh, increased sales of Radicap, but we've also brought back the legacy quality of that brand, and that's aiding a lot in our India domestic business. We announced a merger with Sashun, which is in, in his works in terms of approvals. Uh, a lot of it has progressed, and we expect uh, closing. As you all know, if we consolidate uh, the Sashun numbers from 1st of April of this year, and we, we hope that the courts post their holiday season would probably approve this, and then we should be able to fully integrate and benefit from, uh, from this important corporate action. Uh, Australia has been a great market for us. We've had a, a very strong growth and performance before we sold that business. Uh, Re-entering the Australian market was priority, uh, and we're very delighted uh, with the announcement we made last week about the Australian re-entry. Investments, uh, we've made significant investments in our infrastructure. Uh, we have now commissioned a new R&D center in our Bangalore manufacturing site. Uh, we expanded our flagship FDA approved facility to include creams and ointments, so that's a new niche, uh, and also liquids. Uh, significant footprint in Africa. We have a stated philosophy of being in Africa for Africa. Uh, we've had uh, two manufacturing facilities commissioned, we have two under construction, and we made very, very significant investments in Salesforce automation. Uh, all our systems currently, both in India and Africa, are automated, and we believe that that will add a lot of value in terms of increasing our Salesforce efficiency. Uh, our business is all about risk and how we handle it. Uh, I believe that what we have done in terms of compliance and risk mitigation uh, was important. We have had uh, two FDA inspections, three FDA inspections in our two FDA approved plants in the last 12 months. And I'm pleased to tell you that we have continued GMP compliance status on all the facilities. Um, we have now an industry leading IT enablement program which is led by Cognizant uh, where we have a complete package of mistake proofing our business. I think it's important from, from that perspective. And uh, we believe that we'll be one of the few companies in India which will have a fully integrated IT system running uh, manufacturing and risk uh, part of our business. We had some key collaborations. We, uh, we, we, we announced a transaction with Gilead uh, where we are collaborating with Gilead on two very important drugs, uh, SOF um, and also uh, pleased to tell you that we've already launched the soft drug. Uh, obviously, that is in partnership with Natco, but that's, uh, that was a temporary launch so that we could be there in the market day one. And I'm pleased to now let you know that our product uh, has completed bioequivalence and clinical studies successfully, and we should be in the market uh, not only in India and various other markets very soon. Um, with the Malaria Initiative, we have a, a project with MMV, which, uh, which where we make uh, a new delivery for pediatric rectal use of artemether lumi, which is a drug used for anti-malarial. Uh, there are two partners of MMV, which is Cipla and Strides. Uh, we believe uh, with our leading position on this drug, we should be in the market uh, first. I would like to assume that. For some of our shareholders, you'll be pleased to note that we announced a 108 rupee dividend uh, during this last 12 months, including the 3 rupee dividend that was announced last Friday. Uh, interestingly, our market capitalization increased from $370 million to $1.1 billion in the last 12 months. So it's been a, a performance focus on profitability, like I said in my opening statement. So FY15 revenues have been 
fairly flat, 1100, uh, 1140 crores to 1220 crores and apologies my Australian friends, we are using some very colloquial number games, so um, not, it's not in millions and um, our EBITDA has grown from 200 crores in the last 12 months to 260 crores. So I, I was just wondering if I'm boring you because you seem to be disinterested. Um, pharma EBITDA margins has increased by 400 basis points. I was referring to you, gentlemen. Um, but 300, almost 400 basis points to 21.3%. And adjusted PAT uh, has been 170 crores. Uh, but we can answer specific questions around this. Adjusted EPS was 28.61. And we do not have any debt or very marginal debt. Our debt equity is about 0.16. Uh, okay. So the Q4 uh, has been a strong finish. Um, revenues again has been flat, but profits has increased from 59 crores to 74 crores. Uh, it's been consistent for the last two quarters. Margins increased by 400 basis points. Um, adjusted PAT was 37 crores, and obviously our debt equity remains the same. So if I take you through specific markets, uh, the regulated markets is a key focus for strides. Uh, we, the U.S. market is important, but it is the other markets that we play. Uh, we want to become an important player. Um, revenues only grew 42 uh, by 4 percent, which was about 425 crores. But our North American operations for the first time, and this is our first full year where we front-ended our business. So I know that there are a lot of people who have just walked into the room, but we agreed on some ground rules that mobile phones will be switched off. I'm sorry, but I cannot continue this meeting if you need to speak on your phone. Because, like I said, this is being webcast. We have challenges. We had a lot of complaints from investors globally when they're not able to hear us. So please respect our small request. We... Uh, the North American business exceeded 100 crores for the first time and we successfully launched five new products in the U.S. including calcitriol and methoxicillin which are our key products. Uh, vancomycin, uh, our market share increased significantly to 53%. Uh, obviously it's a small product and it's in partnership uh, with another company but it did increase uh, significantly. R&D spend increased almost 50 percent but it's not a number that we are very pleased with. Uh, we could have and should have spent more money in R&D. It's simply because when we did the transaction with Mylan, uh, we were obliged to hand over the core R&D center to them as part of the transaction. So to have rebuilt the new R&D center and having created the new people and capabilities and practices took us a little time. Uh, but that's now behind us. The new center is up and running. And we believe that we will have the acceleration in R&D and our R&D spends will be significantly higher as a combined entity going forward next year. Um, that also results in the number of filings. We only had six new product filings, uh, at, but for the first time we had two FTF filings. Those of you follow us and cover us, we don't discuss products, so no point asking this question, we won't tell you that. Um, New dedicated global R&D facility uh, went on stream and as we now have 33 cumulative filings with 16 pending approvals and they are all non-PEFA filings. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the PEFA filings are basically filings done under the HIV program of the U.S. government and that's not part of these numbers. Emerging markets has been a key focus. Uh, Africa has been a great year for us. Uh, it represents now 33% of the group revenues up from 22-25. We grew 41% in this market. So we are a 400 crore business uh, in, Afri in, in emerging markets. That's despite uh, adverse currency moments. So we had significant challenges with the euro which is linked to the CFA which is the French, uh, French Africa currency. And we also had a, a severe devaluation of almost 30% in Nigeria. 
So in spite of that, we grew 41%. Um, Rena, a flagship brand in India, which is predominantly strong in South of India, post the Raricap acquisition, is now become an All India brand. Uh, we are increasing our footprints in India. We only have about 600, 650 medical reps, but I think we will get to a very important size in the near term. And uh, I'm very pleased with Renov's uh, global revenues uh, at 75 crores. I think that this will continue to grow in a very aggressive uh, manner. Um, headcount was up 60% in, in Africa in terms of foot soldiers. So we have about 200 plus medical reps. Um, our average revenue per medical rep is significantly higher than the Indian industry average, uh, minus the top three players. Um, we have initiated a, an, an e-detailing through iPads. This is the first company in Africa, so that's very well received because doctors in Africa, typically the market is so small in terms of population of doctors that they tend to become specialists in various fields of medicine. So continuous medical education is key in, in getting company-wide company acceptance and that's something which we do in Africa very well. India is finally gaining traction. It was a very suboptimal business. Uh, we crossed revenues of 1 billion for the first time. Rena uh, had sales of around 60 crores. Um, Radicap, we, were, we acquired that business only for six months. That had a good, good uh, ramp up too. And uh, Radicap is now being introduced in the branded markets in Africa. Our institutional business, uh, which is what we supply, the HIV and the anti-malarial business, is the smallest of the business opportunity. I mean, we are the smallest player compared to our competition. So it's a billion dollar market. And at $60 million, we are the smallest player because we are not integrated. We believe that the Sashan integration, Sashan acquisition, or the, uh, excuse me, the merger, and the integration of Sashan would completely transform us to become a very important player in this business. Given all the regulatory risks, this business is no more a business of top line. It has become a very profitable business for all the players because everybody has got themselves disciplined on pricing and it's, it's obviously getting a very, very good business. We are working very closely with Sashan to try and integrate these products very quickly and I'm very confident that we should be able to do that. We spoke about our agreements with Gilead on the SOF and the Havoni, uh, but we also have uh, a, announced an agreement with them for the TAF-based drugs, which are the new HIV drugs. We believe that the, the four drug therapies and the three drug therapies will completely replace the existing therapies. And with integration into Sashun, we should be able to be day one players on these products. Biotech is a business which uh, is nascent, uh, does take a lot of our capital and our attention, uh, but I'm pleased to let you know that our two products are going full steam in terms of animal talks and animal studies. Uh, we believe that both products will go into phase one before the end of this financial year, and we should be in a position to license at least one of these drugs in this financial year. That's our target. Um, we also have a strategic investment from GMS Holdings who are our partners uh, from MS Pharma and GMS Holdings in Jordan. And together with them, we will build a business for the emerging markets. Uh, obviously, that investment is still awaiting the FIBP approval. Just take you quickly through some recent corporate actions uh, and the updates around it. So, Sashan merger is on track. Uh, and we are very delighted with the strategic direction that, the, that Sashan is already taking. To give you an example, Q5-15 revenues were having EBITDA of only 11.2%. But if you look at Q4, uh, we are already in a position to influence the strategic value of creating value over, over volume. And the EBITDA margins have already moved. Obviously, this is also aided uh, by the fact that the Cramps business in UK, which took away a lot of the profits in the first three quarters, have turned around. And we believe the cramps business, the issues of the cramps business is completely behind Sashur. I do not believe that we will have one quarter going forward where cramps will be negative. So that's a very, very good plus. 
Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. There's only so much one can do when the merger is still not official. Uh, so we, we think in the next two to three months, uh, we should be very, uh, we should be in a good position to start integrating uh, Sashun and this and its businesses. All this obviously are based on uh, public information that we have. And uh, <clears throat> what is interesting to note is that the formulation business of Sashun, which only operates in the U.S. market, um, is growing rapidly. We would expect some product approvals very soon. Uh, that will be great for the business and some, not, some of those products are not partnered so that will ramp up uh, the U.S. business and we gave you some pro forma numbers based on LTM when we announced the deal. Actually, we had it I think in this room. Uh, we believe that the U.S. consult business would be close to about moving from 100 crores to about 70 to 75 million dollars which is great from, from a critical size. Uh, Sashin reported uh, very successful FDA audits on all its four U.S. FDA approved sites. So between the two companies, I mean all the three uh, U.S. FDA approved sites. So between the two companies, all its six FDA approved facilities are FDA approved current as in that's, that's important that for the next two to three years we have a good position from that perspective. Australia is our favorite market. We've been extremely successful in this market. Um, for those of you who don't know our transaction with Ascent, um, we, we invested together with Dennis. Dennis was the founder of Ascent. Uh, we had a business in Singapore. Dennis and I combined our businesses um, and we delisted the company which was in the Australian stock market, privatized it, focused, created value, and uh, we sold that a set for $395 million uh, in 2012 and uh, that was what was the beginning of the momentum of what we call the version 2 of Strides. It delivered value for all of us, for our stakeholders and for our partners and we believe we can do this again. So we just completed our non-compete in January and we were looking at um, opportunities in the Australian market. It's a market we know very well. It's a very, very difficult to mark, uh, market to operate and there were compelling reasons for us as, a, as corporates and partners for us to do a deal which came to us at a very significant multiple. So if you re recall, we sold that business at 21 times EBITDA. There, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions is that why are you buying a better business at 10 times? So that's great. That's uh, we like to believe we are very good at buying and very good at selling um, and we can talk a little bit about that in granularity. So, uh, so that industry leading EBITDA multiple has still not been beaten in Australia and I don't think it will be uh, and we believe that we have a, a far superior set today and I'll let Dennis to talk about the quality of that business. Uh, we expect uh, the transaction to close uh, in the next 90 days because we are, not an, we are not in the Australian market so the equivalent of the FIBP and the CCI uh, would be fairly fast track is our belief. Um, at 31 percent and then 37 million dollars of EBITDA on Australian EBITDA, this is by far the most profitable business of the Strides Group once this is closed. So what it actually does is that I mean as, as you guys thought that we were done with Sashun, uh, we were not. We were actually working on some things and this is what it was. So we, we moved the f base business that we refer to in strides. We moved it from 10, 10 or 11 percent EBITDA to 21 percent EBITDA in three years. Then when we announced our transaction with Sashun because of the 13, the suboptimal EBITDA percentages, we were going down to about 15 percent as a combined entity. That's if you recall when we said. With this, we'll get back to our current industry, uh, our current average EBITDA, which is great. So not only does it, uh, does it give us a cushion to do all the course correction at Sashun and integrate it uh, with us, it also gives us the, the, the EBITDA play, which is very important from the amount of leverage that we can do as a consequence. That's, that's very, very interesting. It's immediately EPS accredited. We can talk numbers. It's between 8 and 10 rupees. You guys do your math, but it is in that range. Um, our cost, we will be borrowing money. 
so we are no more debt free uh, and we were we were in that very happy situation for 14 months we we are comfortable to leverage we have uh, a disciplined approach to debt uh, in our version 2 which cannot exceed uh, at the close of the year over three times so we may be 3.25 at the beginning of the year but by the end of the year we should be at three times of EBITDA. Um, and there's going to be significant investments in CapEx it, at Sashon, significant ramp up in R&D. So we will be uh, slightly leveraged over three times for, for a short period of time. But by the end of the next financial year, we'll be back uh, based on our combined EBITDA, uh, what you, I'm sure many of you will do the math yourselves. So that's uh, about it. But I think the most compelling reason why we did this transaction is was I was able to wake my good friend Dennis up from his retirement uh, after having done a great outcome for, for Strides and for himself. Uh, and I think Andrew, uh, Andrew and Dennis um, make a great team. Not, not that I think, I know they make a great team. I had the great privilege and pleasure of working with them earlier. Uh, but I think uh, if Dennis has agreed to partner with us, it's simply because he believes that this is the asset which will make us number one in Australia and very quickly. Thank you. So, is there, uh, is there more slides? So, so I'm, I'm going to request Dennis uh, to come and address uh, Arrow, take you through Arrow, and that's how we're going to trade in Australia, Arrow Pharmaceuticals. He'll tell you why Arrow, and then between, and then we will have a, I'll have a conclusion session, and then we'll open the session for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a number of years since I've been back in India and presenting to a crowd in Mumbai, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be back here. And as Arun said, the key point being that uh, I don't think I would have come out of my, my enjoyable semi-retirement without a better asset than the one that uh, Arun came to me and said, this is the acquisition we should make to get back into the Australian marketplace. And for many reasons, it's... Uh, it is one of the premium assets in the Australian marketplace and we have the opportunity to make, a, um, make it an even better asset. And I'll walk through the business with you, but I'll also present you with a little more of an understanding of the Australian marketplace so you have a better context in terms of understanding uh, why this is the, the, the asset it is and why we can achieve the goals we, we set ourselves. Arrow Pharmaceuticals, or what was the, well, what was originally the Arrow Pharmaceutical business, which was acquired by Aspen in 2008, um, is now going to be the Arrow Pharmaceutical business, was one of the leading businesses, uh, generic pharmaceutical business, and was one of my competitors back in the time, and, and mine and Arun's competitors back in the time when we were uh, running the Ascent business. Today it's the second largest by drug portfolio in the Australian marketplace and again I'll explain why that is a significant factor in success in the Australian market. And it's the third largest by market share in terms of uh, volume and value in the overall generic pharmaceutical marketplace. Again the key point in, in Australia is, is, is it's very much a people and relationship business. I'll explain that further but, to, but we're able to bring together very quickly a lot of our old um, friends and colleagues who over the past three years, while, while Arun and I have been um, out of the market and restrained from operating a market, are all very keenly hoping to come back and join us uh, to build an even a greater enterprise. It has strong customer branding. It has actually one of the strongest in terms of OTC as well as generics. So we're also entering the... Uh, the, the branded uh, over-the-counter pharmacy, uh, pharmacy business in, with this acquisition. Um, the business does present us with mul multiple growth opportunities and uh, not only just in, in terms of the pipeline but in terms of the, the integration with the Strides business. And that's really where we see some of the material upsides from the business we're buying today. So I'm going to give you a quick run through in terms of what the Australian marketplace looks like and what are the key, key drivers that uh, uh, we've experienced that drive this marketplace. There's, there's only 5,000 pharmacies in Australia. It's a very regulated market and only pharmacists can own uh, a, a, 
a shop, to run a pharmacy and also dispense pharmaceuticals. There are three major wholesalers. Those wholesalers control 100% of the $12 billion of pharmaceutical and pharmacy product which goes through pharmacy every year. There are five generic pharmaceutical companies that are, control 90% of all generics supplied into the marketplace and I'll explain why that is. But those five companies are the same five companies in many ways that have been around since the late 1990s. They have gone through several acquisitions and divestitures along the way but that's the only way that significant players and significant um, market share has been gained in this marketplace. I'm lucky to be one of the two um, Australian founders of, of a generic pharmaceutical company who've achieved more than 10% market share in building a business in this marketplace. Despite what what's you, you hear in the press a little bit, it is a, it is a very stable market for generic pharmaceutical pricing and I'll explain that some more. But we're currently, we're about two and a half times, the average generic price in Australia is about two and a half times the prices in the United, in the United Kingdom. Some are a lot higher, but that's roughly where we, where we sit as an average. And we do, there, there's, a, there's a lot in the press about the government looking for, to create PBS reforms to change pricing where it was much higher in the Australian marketplace. Now let me, be, let me, let me explain something about the structure of these pharmaceutical benefits reforms. So the government is the sole buyer in the Australian marketplace. The problem with the, with the government had about seven years ago was that generic pharmaceutical substitution was increasing dramatically. So in 2002, generic substitution was about 30%. At the moment, it's sitting around 75 to 80%. But that change in generic pricing only delivered benefit to one group, pharmacists. So a pharmacist was still dispensing the drug at the price the government was, uh, was, was regulating, but they were buying at a significantly lower prices from the generic pharmaceutical manufacturers who were interested in creating volume and that created the price differential. So there came a time when the government said, well, we can't have taxpayers funding effectively the, the profits in pharmacy in Australia and they created these, this reform mechanism. The reform mechanism does not impact or set generic pricing. Generic pricing in Australia is only set by one factor and that is competition between the generic companies. And those, those competitive factors are what I'll describe in the next couple of slides. So when a price is changed by government, it only affect, it affects two groups. The branded pharmaceutical price, which was the one that was two, three times higher than the generic price, and it affects the amount of money a pharmacist will make from dispensing a generic. So at a point when a pharmacist might be making $20 from dispensing a generic, when a PBS reform comes in, that will adjust the amount of money he makes in terms of profit. He might only make $10 from dispensing that generic. But the generic pricing is not set or affected by that. In fact, the government can only ever bring down the pricing under these reforms to within 10% of the generic pricing across the market. So that, that's, that's, that's in fact the, the key fundamental driver and why being a generic supplier in this market still remains um, effectively a, price, a competitive driven marketplace. So the critical success factors which have made it very difficult for new players to come in and why, these, why the five companies that exist today with 90% have actually held that market share for the last 15 years um, is because one of the biggest factors to servicing Australian pharmacists is range. A single pharmacist wants one generic supplier. Okay? That is a significant point in this marketplace because what that means is that um, our pharmaceuticals now with close to 20% market share means every time we introduce a new drug we get 20% market share. We don't have to ask anyone for it, our customers just buy it from us. So a customer is your customer for your whole range and that's why there are only five companies in the Australian marketplace that have a range in excess of, of 100 molecules. So the minimum entry point is 100 molecules but Arrow has probably the second largest range with nearly 150 molecules in its portfolio. And every one of our customers who are our, what we call first line customers effectively buy 
the, that entire range from us and we'll buy new drugs as we introduce them into the marketplace. The next, the next part about getting new customers is about building relationships. Uh, relationships in the Australian marketplace 10 years ago, 15 years ago were largely about dealing with independent pharmacies. Today the marketplace has changed as pharmacists have decided that it's better to buy together and maybe negotiate better terms. But it also means there's, there's less infrastructure cost in doing that. When you service one group of 20, 30 pharmacists, you don't need three or four representatives to do that. You do that with one key account manager. So in one sense, you, you, what you give up a little bit in pricing, you get back by lower infrastructure in terms of dealing with that customer and trying to manage those relationships. Yeah? And the, the, the final point, of course, is pricing. But that pricing, when you take the first two factors into account, is really related with your understanding of the competitive marketplace, what services you can create, and the innovation we can build. So this business and our previous business was, we felt that pricing was the last thing we should give away. We should be trying to create better services for our customers, ways for them to drive more traffic into their business, ways for them to feel more confident that they'll always have supply when they need it, because if they don't have one of our um, drugs to dispense, then they'll have to dispense the branded drug. So that's, that's going to cost them in terms of profit. So, you, do th so you, you worry about things like delivery on time, making sure you're, you're in stock. And to be honest with you, not all of our competitors do that very well, particularly the ones that are focused on, with, on, a, on a global enterprise where they may be the last ones to take delivery of a product because there are other markets more interesting to their, to their parent. So we, we've always been able to and with the business, again, we'll, we'll operate with a, with a local focus and all our supply partnerships are designed around that. So there are the three, there are three critical factors in, in the Australian marketplace and when you overlay those, um, you, get, you, you, you get to understand why our position is so sustainable. This next slide is, is showing you one other major factor in the Australian market. The three wholesalers are aligned with a preferred supply arrangement with three of the, the, the five key generic companies. And Sigma is the company, which also is the, the, the company with the largest market share in terms of pharmacy wholesaling, which is aligned with the Aspen and currently the Arrow business. Okay? Um, Myland and Apotex work with the other two wholesalers. That is, that is without a doubt one of the strongest propositions in this marketplace. Okay? It means that particularly Sandoz and Amneal who are the, the, the other two full range players, their market share and their ability to access customers is always a consequence of how, you know, how they can get to a customer even though the customer prefer to deal with the preferred supplier of that wholesaler. Okay? So that's another key sustainability factor in our position in this marketplace. Right? And it works both ways because we help, we help the wholesaler get customers and they help us get customers. So it is a symbiotic relationship. So, they're, they're, so that's kind of setting the background. So what I'll talk a little bit about is the, is, is the business um, as we'll, we'll approach it. So the Arrow brand is a very strong legacy in the market. So you know, when we talked about how we should approach it, we thought, let's bring this back to something that people understand. Brand building is a very expensive exercise in Australia and if you've got a solid brand, you're better off starting from that base. So that it, it is a strong recognised brand and a brand that also identifies with the culture we want to build in the business, a culture of innovation and services. Um, as, as, as Arun said, one of the, the key points for us doing this is that we were able to bring together again, a very experienced management team. A lot of the people who will be coming into this business are either ex-Arrow or working with us previously in Ascent. So they know how we work, they understand the Strides organisation and the strengths we can, we can create through that integration. But more importantly, you know, they understand how we build a business. We built Ascent from scratch and so even though we're starting with a very strong business, they also understand that we're not doing this to stay at this, in this position. We're building this to build the number one player in the market. And that excites people. Um, I think I've mentioned, I mentioned before about the full range ensuring a, a single point supply relationship with pharmacy. You know, again, our, we continue to see ourselves being able to keep our range proposition strong 
again integrating back with, with strides and the growth in, in new products and the portfolio we get, but we'll also be able to address things like how we maintain our competitiveness and also how we increase our, our gross profit and earnings. Um, a key difference between this business and one of our old business, there's two key differences we had in this business than we had in our old business. One is this tail which goes, instead of the 100 products we used to have to 150, is very significant in that it has low competition. It's a great place to get customers, but it's also where we don't really have to discount much to get substitution. Yeah. So it's a big driver of, of profit. And, and in, in smaller molecules where we're not also expecting, there's no, there's no reason why somebody's even going to take the time to try and register the, in, the, in the market. The other one's IP ownership. Our, the previous business was largely a collaborative business where we licensed pretty much everything. Um, that's great and we had good supply arrangements, but our controls and levers were, were less than we have today. Today, um, the IP for the products that deliver about 70% of our revenue will be, will be ours and to, to, to work with and particularly for, for us to leverage off the, the, the strengths of strides as a, as a manufacturer. Um, and a key point in that is that the Australian Regulatory, a Regulatory Agency in the TGA does not take a long time, like in other markets, to allow us to change manufacturer. Right? So the current, the current time frames in which they do the, the changes are around three to six months. Yeah? So in other markets that becomes a barrier, but in the Australian market it's, it's much less a regulatory barrier. And finally, you know, we... we Part of the services that I talked about that we offer to pharmacists is we also help pharmacists understand the value of generic substitution. We give them reporting tools. We give them um, applications that look at what they dispense. Every time they dispense a brand, the pharmacist knows that, he, that whoever's dispensed that has cost him some money. And we give them reports that tell them how much money they've left behind by not dispensing more generics. So a key part of this business is to create greater um, compliance to a generic substitution strategy. And that's, that's been why the Australian market through um, offers like this and through drive from the generic um, ph uh, pharmaceutical suppliers, we've created more generic substitution in the Australian marketplace. And, and, and lastly, this, this acquisition also brings to us um, one of the leading over-the-counter brands that are used by pharmacy um, to, in terms of their customer alignment. So we, this brand of Chemistone, and it's a, it's a large range of 95 um, uh, SKUs or 51 different products, is driven in uh, as pharmacy-only medications. It's priced well. Consumers, it's a well-recognised consumer brand that today... Um, is, is one of the leading brands sold in 20% of pharmacies in, the, in Australia as the main range of over-the-counter um, pharmacy products that they give to, their, to, the, to the patients and consumers that come into their marketplace. And that becomes part of this acquisition. This has probably got um, a significant amount of opportunity for us because um, you know, we think previously um, the... Uh, uh, it, was, it was less of a focus for Aspen because of a, a larger range of other products they had to sell um, and, and for us it can become much more of a focus so we see a, a lot of upside in that. So that pretty much, that pretty much covers the, the, the presentation on the, on the Arrow business and why we think this, is, this really is uh, a terrific, unique um, opportunity and one which... Um, Arun, when he came to me, I said, you know, you really can't pass this by because it isn't going to come up again. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, just two points uh, that I'd like to add on what Dennis said is, uh, one is that the first three names, Apotex, Mylan, and Aspen, and now Arrow, together, together the way the, the three top companies own 70% of the total Australian market, generic market. Uh, you may want to ask yourself why there is no Indian company successful. There's nobody who's got even 5% market share, even if they've been in the market for the last 15 years. So it's not about pricing, and that's why you have a 250% uh, 
margin over UK. It's about connectivity and it's about how you work with the pharmacy chains and, and all of that. Um, the, the other point uh, that I wanted to discuss uh, about, about this transaction is that <coughs> uh, while you do all your math, uh, please understand that this is a carve out of Aspen is the largest Australian pharmaceutical company with revenues of $800 million. This is a cow out of their business and please ensure, please try to understand that while the 37 percent, 37 million EBITDA looks extremely attractive, uh, there are, we haven't estimated any synergies as yet. The transaction takes about 90 days to close this work in progress around that. But we also expect our setup costs and corporate costs, one time corporate costs to be slightly higher in the first year, but we believe that synergies will take care of it. But there will be a lag between spending and recovery. Uh, so when you do your modeling, you could just do all of that. I think uh, we just have one last slide. Just just go back to that. Uh, as I thought that will be very important uh, because uh, many of you probably do not understand the relevance of all the corporate, corporate actions in one single slide. So we thought we'll do that for you. So just to give you an idea. Um, go ahead. So when we sold Agila, uh, our Q115 revenues was $43 million. Okay. Adjusted for numbers accounted by all the three companies, a quarterly run rate is $135 million. So we moved from $43 million Q1 of this year opening with the corporate actions, we are $135 million per quarter company. So we moved to the run rate is about $550 million. So just to give you the scale and scope of our corporate actions, they have been very, very significant. What is very, what is also important, we are not talking about EBITDA numbers, but that's, I am sure I need to let you guys do some work. Um, on the business itself, uh, we have a very different type of business. Earlier we had $43 million with 42%. They all percentages are not relevant. We had a 109 crore regulated formulations business. That's going to 345 crores per quarter. So that run rate is close to 1500 crores of formulation sales. Uh, emerging markets uh, is, has moved from 73 crores and there's no corporate action we have done. So the 73 crores to 126 crores is pure organic growth. Just gives you the depth of our in Africa, for Africa and our India strategies that are delivering results. Our institutional business has, has gone from 780 to 90, uh, from 78 crores to 98 crores. This is mainly led with, with our incremental sales in anti-malarials which only happened in the second half of the year. This is a business we believe will have significant upscales, but we have to wait for the integration to actually happen, and that may take us a little time. Uh, our API business is not the business that we want to talk about too much, but it will uh, give us revenues of about 256 crores per quarter, including our cramps business. 70% of our business, I am told by my colleagues at Sachin, is regulated markets. So we, we have... A, if you look at if you look at the if you, conclude, if you look at the conclusion, we have moved from a, a small suboptimal 43 million dollar run rate company to a 135 million dollar company per quarter with scale, scope, and size. So that's that's what we have managed to do in the last 12 months. Thank you. So. Just to ensure that we have questions only using a mic as requested and uh, please state your name and the firm or the company you represent and we'll be happy to then uh, answer your questions. And please also we, we request that we, you ask us two questions at best and then come back on the queue if there are, if there's more time we can obviously take more questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, Alec Talal from 130 Capital. On the Australian business, uh, the acquisition multiple at 10 times uh, seems attractive. I mean, you've sold a business a couple of years ago at 21 times. 
and uh, you know this is a corporation that probably doesn't need to sell a business from a capital structure standpoint so one can you tell us you know why you were able to get this at 10 times ebitda and uh, secondly is the overall how much of the uh, portfolio is sort of vertical vertically integrated backwards into apis right now or are they buying third party and what sort of sort of uh, costing benefits do you see uh, coming into coming into this business Uh, I can answer that for you. So, one is uh, Aspen uh, is a strategic partner which strides for many years. If you go back in history, we've done transactions across Brazil, a partnership in oncology, and there's a, a, a and, and the GSK licensing deal all through our contacts with Aspen. Steve, uh, Aspen CEO, and I go a long way, and we have uh, a, a stated philosophy of working together. closely in various markets and when he wanted when he is moving and uh, probably you what you probably don't know about aspen is that in aspen in the last 3 years has moved his market cap from 2.6 billion to 15 billion dollars aspen is very focused on becoming a specialty pharmaceutical company and its main idea of exiting generics in specific markets uh, is to do to stay focused on the uh, on the business it was a distressed asset what aspen bought from sigma so sigma had a lot of corporate history it was a distressed asset so from aspen's perspective this is a profitable exit uh, and because it was a carve out it would have and it was a structure that we didn't both companies didn't want to involve bankers and run an auction process it was what we call in our business a fireside chat where Steve doesn't drink wine. Uh, he, I had a scotch and he had a wine, and then we did a deal. So that's what is called a fireside chat. So um, it's obviously to do with the history the two companies share, and it's got nothing to do with an auction process. I, I believe he knows very well that had an auction been done, he'd probably get a couple more turns on the EBITDA. Uh, what is attractive, and your question is actually very telling. We should have put that up. When we owned Ascent, we didn't own IP. we only owned marketing authorizations so for example we were distributing products manufactured by ipca lupin or cipla or a european company but we had the brand name and the marketing authorizations here 70% of the ip purely belongs to us which means that we do not need to ask anybody to shift source of manufacture there are significant synergies that is expected but we do not want to put a number at this time all i can tell you is that the synergies will ensure but for a small dip as we set up corporate infrastructure we'll get back to this number or improve upon these numbers over time okay and one uh, the one other point that i was saying when dennis before the slide and actually i missed is that please try to understand australia has got 23 million people it is too small a market for for any company to develop a product specific to australia so the australian regulatory authorities require you and that's changing now but australian regulatory authorities require you to do bioequivalent studies based on an australian reference standard and when the market opportunity for a particular molecule may be as a generic drug 5 million dollars and there are three players a new player developing a dosier and preparing 100 doses will not work and that is why if you recall very recently arbindo sold away all its pipeline and doses in australia for free and they mentioned that they develop a lot of products but they have no revenues so a company which is fully integrated from api to formulations for and with a pipeline which is very very robust if they had to give away all their doses for free there's a good reason why you couldn't sell and that's why what dennis said in terms of the market uh you know the market uh, dynamics is very different from the us and the reason why we wanted to meet many of you today is for you not to say selling in australia is like selling in in the us and if we, and i'm sure that this will be a very very significant positive first strike yeah. can we have no sir can we use this also so Yeah, yeah, this is this is Chirag from HD, Chirag from HDFC Mutual Fund. Uh, quick question: You mentioned that uh, 
one pharmacist wants only one generic company for all the molecules. Can you just spend some time on trying to explain how that sort of works out and why that is? Yes, certainly. Um, can, you, can you hear me with this one? Yep. So uh, why that is is because it really has to do with the history of the Australian generic marketplace. Um, there was only ever one, until 1985, there was only one generic pharmaceutical company in the entire country. Um, when that company got sold in 1995 originally, it had 100% market share. Um, as, as new players came in, um, their market share was diminished because uh, they, they effectively were not prepared to to create the pricing competition that they hadn't experienced before. Um, but the one thing that remained was that pharmacists did not want to fragment their purchasing. They don't have the time. They're not inclined to think that they want three or four companies when they have been exposed to very strong profits by dealing with one company. So in many ways, the five companies who, who operate today have a responsibility to themselves to make sure that pharmacists don't need more than one company to first appreciate the profits that they can make out of generic substitution, but secondly, you know, make their lives easier. So it is a unique part of the nature of the Australian marketplace and, and it is not well understood by, by people around the world, but certainly it, it has meant that doing what I did when I first time, uh, the first time around, um, it meant that it, it creates... Anybody who wants to come into the Australian marketplace today and, and why we have 30 to 40 different people supplying us potentially products um, is because they have to come through one of us to get access to the Australian marketplace. And when they do, we, we effectively ensure 20% market share. So that also means that we tend to have very, very, very good control over what we end up paying when we negotiate third-party contracts. Because if they don't supply us, they won't be supplying anybody um, unless they get one of the other players to do it. So that creates a lot of the strength in, in the local market for the local players. Does that explain your question? Wouldn't yeah, they? I just, just let me just try and, from your perspective, let me just try and address this again. Um, so just so you know, the Australian law until very recently, just like in India, a pharmacist can only own a pharmacy store, not like in the US or UK, a chain can't own. Okay? The law has been amended to for five uh, ownership, a pharmacy can, a pharmacist can own five pharmacies. Australian pharmac pharmacists make the highest amount of money in the world amongst all pharmacists because it's a very profitable business. Right? So, they, because they make a lot of money, they are not really keen to go and make another 30,000 or 40,000 because they make money not only in generics but they also keep the brand, they get distribution, they have cosmetics, OTCs and all of that. They are not very keen to... So you need to understand the generic market is only 600 or 700 million of the total 8 billion dollar market. So on the 600 million which may be one tenth or 10 percent of its total store sales is not looking at making going to five, six people to get a better price. So he's looking at somebody who can give him the whole range and that's why they have pharmacy alliances where these individual pharmacies combine into a cooperative and start buying from you. So you work with them and you can actually, Dennis was a pioneer in consolidating, consolidating these pharmacists under what we call an umbrella brand. So if you call a pharma save or a pharmacy alliance, it's actually a loose cooperative of individual pharmacies and then they can buy together. And that's how they get better pricing. So, but they deal with the wholesalers, right? And not directly with the generic manufacturers. No, we have to do the deals ourselves. So, yeah. And the other question is on the funding of the acquisition. What will be the effective interest cost that we've sort of penciled in? And Five and a half percent. This will be in local currency. It's a combination of AUD and USD, hedged. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Sudarshan from Sundaram Mutual Funds. Uh, can you give us a history? Can you? Sorry. Yes. I'm yeah. here. Yeah. 
Uh, can you give us just, a just can you repeat your name please? Uh, Sudarshan from Sundara Mutual Funds. Uh, can you give us a historical perspective of uh, your company to the extent as been what is the kind of therapies that you were into? What is the kind of historical growth that you are, uh, you know, seeing over the last two to three years? And probably if you can give us some light as to, you mentioned that there is a strong pipeline in place. So what is the kind of therapy that we are going to focus on and the kind of launches that we can see going forward? So, so um, the Australian uh, portfolio we have covers every therapy area. So other than staying outside of oncolytics um, and, and certainly you know, injectable products, we cover every therapy area and have, as I said, 149 different molecules. They combine to, I think, over 440 different presentations in terms of uh, products in, in, in the pharmaceutical space. So that means we, we cover every area. And it also means that our pipeline similarly is very broad. So right now, with the, with the acquisition, there are, there are 51 new molecules that are under, under that, um, the new pipeline for launch and they extend out between 2000 and the, the, the rest of this year through for the next, next two to three years. Um, of course, we need to keep developing that and that's part of the, the process of the, of the market in Australia. And uh, currently now that you've acquired, uh, I mean, Strides has acquired this business, now how long would it actually take for Strides to actually backward integrate for the products that is required by Aspen? And what kind of savings on a ballpark do you think you can actually achieve? Well, it's, it's, it's a function of uh, contracts. So we are in the process of going through each supply chain contract to understand A, what's the inventory in hand and what uh, what is the contracts in terms of exit? There is no exclusivity. With seventy percent of the products, there is no exclusivity. It's also an ability on what type of products Strides or Sashun can manufacture. Uh, it's not that we have all type of manufacturing capabilities in the pharmaceutical spectrum. Um, I would like to believe that the 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 the, the other plus about the Australian market is it has got the most efficient regulatory system. So you can actually pay a fee and be sure that you will get a rejection or an approval in less than nine months, which is the, the plus point about the Australian regulatory process compared to an average of three or four years in the US or maybe a year in, uh, in Europe. Um, so we can always site change and the Strides facility is TJ approved for 15 years. We've been selling into Australia for 15 years. So we don't see that to be a problem. But I, I would like to, like, like to just not put any number today. All I can tell you is um, we believe that we should be able to maintain these margins uh, by a combination of synergies and increased pipeline that comes from the combined entity between Sashun and Shrubs. Um <coughs> Hi, this is uh, Aditya from Ambit. Sorry? Aditya from Ambit. Yeah, I am. Hi. Uh, so, sir, firstly, to uh, just step out of uh, this uh, arrow deal for the time being and uh, focus on your European business because that's still slightly, you know, a sizable business in our in our stable. Um, as you mentioned, Orbindo, right? So they had to dispose their Australia business because you know they couldn't market the products. The the same company bought a business from Activist at almost zero value because Activist couldn't make money on it. Uh, how's your business in Europe today and what's the, what's the plan there? Okay, so we only sell in UK. We have a front-ended business in UK called Cofama, uh, which sells only in the UK market. Um, it's been a business which has done very well for us. Uh, we make uh, over 30% EBITDA in that business by a product selection, but we are not a big business. It's a it's a suboptimal business. It's not. It will never be a hundred million dollar business. But uh, can it get to a 25, 30, 40 million dollar business? Yes, in the next three to four years. But we only sell in UK. We do not sell in any other European market. Uh, and especially UK is a lot more easier for us now that we have this additional capability at Sachin in Newcastle. Um, the whole process of producing in different languages for small quantities is what you don't make money in Europe. So 
it's considered Europe is one country, but it is not. So when you actually label or pack the product, you have to pack 200 packs for Latvia and maybe 100,000 packs for Germany. That's not a business we want. So we are focusing only in the UK. Uh, a lot of pipeline is going into the UK. Um, this business was losing 2 million pounds two years ago. It's making about three, three and a half million pounds now. So it's the, that's the swing that we have managed. But it's still a very small scale because we are not looking at top line at all in the UK market. But I think we can get to a, an important number. But it will not be... So how, how we look at Strides version 2 is that we believe US, Australia, um, Africa and the emerging markets and the institutional business will be the large buckets that will get us to that stated revenues, uh, revenue ideas that we have. Uh, businesses in UK or India will be subscale but will be profitable. That's, that's the idea. I, actually, my next question was just uh, regarding your last statement. So now that we have scale in US, we have scale in Australia, uh, Africa is looking good with our organic efforts. Uh, would you now say that it's time for strides to sort of stop transacting for the moment and build the businesses constructed over the last 12, 18 months? Or could we still be sort of looking at some additional corporate action uh, so that we can, you know, we still have some building blocks to be kept in place? I think we have been very disciplined in either acquiring or selling. Uh, that's, that's been our, our strength. Um, have we, do we have the appetite to do more? The balance sheet will support. But we won't, will we do any ticket sizes of this? The answer is no. Will we do incremental transactions? The answer is yes, and that would be in the African geography. Because we are looking at scaling up in Africa. Uh, just to give you an idea, Africa was $10 million in 2010. We reported $60 million now, 60, 60 odd million dollars in Africa, or $55 million. I think it will be very, very easy for us to take it to $100 million in the next two years, but we need assets not to take us to the revenue, but to be present in certain geographies where we are not, where setting up an organic strategy may not work. But those will be very, very limited size, ticket sizes, which the Africa PNL will support on its own. Thank you, sir. All the best. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, this is Prakash from Access uh, Capital. So, question on the U.S. piece first. Uh, Looking at US, I mean, you, you have got the traction now, you started filing a lot of products. Could you just help us understand two things? One is your front end, how big is your front end, and are you happy with the market shares you are getting with the incremental products now? And in three years' time, uh, what's the size you're looking at in the US piece, especially? Okay, so given uh, post the Sashun merger, um, all Sashun products are partnered. Okay. So Sashin has partnerships with Glenmark, with Ranbaxi, and now Sun Pharma, and they also have a partnership with another company called Benson. So one of the conditions on the contract is that they would not partner anymore. So the new portfolio from Sashin is just about coming in except one or two products. Every single product has been already partnered because that was the Sashin model. And I won't blame them for that because till 2011, that was our model too. Um, so... We believe our, our business going out on the combined entity is about $70 million, of which our front end will be about half. Right? The rest is partnered. We have an infrastructure. In, in the U.S., if you're front-ending, you're obliged to set up an infrastructure which, which has to be there for $10 million of revenue or a $1 billion of revenue. So we have that infrastructure. Otherwise, you can't be in that market. But it doesn't take hundreds of people. It takes only five very good uh, sales guys to get to a billion dollars in the business because there are only three or four buyers. So it's the infrastructure in terms of IT, pharmacovigilance, uh, the REMS, which is the, the, um, the additional pharmacovigilance that has to be done in certain products like Pacrolimus or Morphetal. All of that is already in place. So currently we have, uh, we have a third party service provider uh, who will, uh, uh, who's running it for us till the end of uh, this financial, this calendar year, and then we take over those costs. But currently, whatever we're paying the third party service provider is the same cost of what will set up for us to set up. But we didn't 
have that scale and scope at that time, so we used a third party. And that contract gets over now. But the third party sells the product under our livery, so it's a it's a Strides livery that's sold in the U.S. And uh, would we be happy with the current market share which we are getting into the second wave of launches that we are doing? Like recently, we did a couple of products. Yeah, so we have 50% uh, on methoxicillin. We have we have already got 30% on ergocalciferol. But these are not products which are billion dollar products, and we don't care about the size. It's uh, we are very delighted with the margins we make and the growth. I mean, obviously, the Sashin products that are coming in are more prescription ibuprofen, which is large tonnage, large volume. So that's going to, that's not about market share, it's about profit maximization. Yeah, and secondly, on the, the Australian piece, you talked about in 2002, the generic substitution was about 30%, which has moved to 70% plus now. So what has been the, you know, the uh, CAGA growth in the last 5, 10 years? Uh, because since these uh, players are large, have you seen uh, double digit growth or it's been flattish kind of growth? Well, um, okay, one of the, one of the key um, things that have driven the change, so this is where, in fact, the, the, the concept of the reforms that the government introduced has actually helped accelerate um, the generic substitution because the more the government is reducing the price of branded drugs, the more um, a pharmacist is motivated to, to, to change. So, sorry, is that me? Um, so what happened when in 2002, um, the, the pharmacists were making a very good margin from, from generic drugs. They were not very motivated because the companies at the time were pretty much happy with what they were getting. They weren't discounting huge amounts, um, but they were happy with 30%. As competition was driven, uh, particularly when you know, I came into the market and, and we, we started to see that pricing competition was, uh, there was a lot more room, um, that competition you know, drove down pricing, but again, you know, pharmacists found that they were it, it really was a, a process to motivate them, to get them to want to substitute. Again, for the same reason that the average pharmacist wants one pharmaceutical, generic pharmaceutical supplier, they don't, they don't really want to work that hard about you know, substitution. So they weren't motivated. So it's taken time in the Australian market. It's always been you know, several years behind what happens in, in other regulated markets like Canada, etc. Um, but it's been that motivation, changes in government, um, uh, pricing and and effectively the view that um, you know they have to they have to substitute more to make the same money they used to before the government started effectively deciding to take back some of that um, that generic substitution value on net net what's what's it mean um, net net the volume has increased dramatically. Um, but the, I would have to say my, and I'd have to take a guess at this, but I'd have to, the, the, uh, the, obviously the, the amount of value and the profits you make have gone up quite, quite a lot as well because volume has been driven significantly. So we, you know, all the generic companies have been able to negotiate much better cost of goods than when they were when they were only getting 30% volume substitution. So the substitution value and the profit has really come from the volume increase um, but pricing, you know, has been a more competitive. Uh, but net net, it's all upside. Net net, the, the the dollar value and and particularly the volume have gone up significantly. So, is it fair to say the volume has been like uh, double digits and value growth single digits across? I don't, I don't, I don't think we have the answers. Yeah, I don't have the answer. We don't have the answer. But I, I, what I can we tell do. you is that in uh, it probably in 2002 the total value. Um, of generics in the, in the Australian marketplace sold by the, far, the companies was about 250 million. Today it's a billion dollars. Right. And lastly, if you could throw some light yeah. on the... Can we just move on? You've been sure. asking too many questions, please. Yeah. Hello, this is uh, Surya from Philip Capital. I just wanted to understand uh, whether the acquired portfolio witnessed any kind of a price correction over the last one year period? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Has the acquired portfolio witnessed any price correction in the last 12 months? 
price correction. Either by the competition or by compulsory price cut by government? Oh, I, ca I, I, ca I can't answer that, that question specifically. On 149 molecules, I would say that yes, there were some that corrected downwards and some that went, went up. So it really is a, it's a difficult to say market. across, yeah, and it's a function of the market and competition. Okay, and uh, uh, the compulsory price cut, whatever that is there in the, uh, by the common policy, so whether our portfolio would be seeing some sort of correction uh, led by that, and uh, do you see uh, considering this scenario, this the margin will be sustained going ahead. What you commented on? Okay, I think I think you're getting confused with PBS with DPCO. It's not the same. Okay. okay, so the DPCO is what in India we have a price control order, and you can't sell a product greater than that. The PBS works very differently. It it's take, it's trying to take away the obscene profits each pharmacy was making by doing uh, a uh, average targeted price discounting that was mandatory. Okay? So if for example, and this is where the portfolio is very important, if there is no competition on a generic, in, which in our portfolio there are many products because the market is too small, I don't have a second generic. Right? Nobody is going to come and create a dozier for Australia if the market is two million dollars. I see no price discounts on a product like that. A product which is a hundred million dollars like Atrovastatin, you'll probably see price discounts as high as 60 or 70 percent. Earlier, companies used to fund those discounts, but now companies have stopped funding those discounts and telling pharmacies that you have to take the hit yourself. And that is what is happening. So to answer your question, because through a combination of tail brands, which we think are very healthy tail brands, and our market reach, we should be able to maintain the margins. Okay? And historically, these are the margins that Aspen has been declaring in Australia for the last seven years. So it's not that, but we do not know exactly of this carved out business what it is. We can't get that data. Yeah. Second question on... Uh, that's a, this will be a third question, but uh, so it will be... But I think we should just get you come back online. Yeah. One more question. See, you commented uh, on the cramps business of Shashun and you sounded very optimistic about it. You said that it has turned around in the quarter and uh, never it would see a negative number in the bottom line uh, in future. In the so, near future. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Could so, happen. So, so can you just uh, elaborate on that? What change really has happened there and uh, what, conf what is giving that kind of confidence to you? Okay, I think uh, from whatever I know, I mean, it's based on some of the diligence access we had and what we had being a public company, there's only so much we can tell you, is that uh, Sashin was the key supplier to Vertex for the hepatitis drug, which actually flopped after Gilead came into the marketplace. So they had to fill in a very significant gap, and we have the uh, hurries here, so it's about 80 million pounds in three or four years, right? Or, so we had an 80 million pound top line, which we became zero. So we did 80 million pounds because they were building up inventory and all of that. And we went from 40, 50 million pounds of revenues to almost 20 million. So we always, we had an issue of just underutilized capacity, but corporate overage being the same. If you recall in our, uh, in our presentation, we said that there are significant products that we are working, Sashin is working on conversion. And that's happened. So many of those products have now converted, customer conversions have happened. And they have got to a stage where uh, a hepatitis C kind of drug is not yet there, but there are a lot of small things which is keeping it above water. And we believe in the next three to four quarters that will be the case. The new product that you have added in that portfolio? We do add a lot of new products, but we don't discuss products. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the follow-up. Um, two questions. First is on the uh, on the Australia business. If you can give us some sense of the hard asset that we have on the ground in terms of number of people who go out and reach out to these pharmacies, etc. Uh, sure. Um, uh, there are 50 people who are uh, will come along with the uh, as of today. There's a number of people, as I said, that we have had work with us in the past that we will also be considering. Uh, but right as, as we speak, we have 
probably one of the largest field forces that are in the, in the, in the country in terms of being able to access pharmacy because of the breadth of our customer range. And this 50 number is adequate to sort of address all the 5,000 plus pharmacies that exist? Correct. Uh, as I said, it's probably, it's probably up there. I, I think the top three companies all have a similar size field force um, accessing, as you said, those, uh, those 5,000 pharmacies across the country. Okay. That was useful. Um, how does the tax rate at the consolidated entity change after the acquisition? Okay. Yeah, so, um, so what we have done is recently we have done um, uh, the, uh, we have uh, restructured internally and uh, overall we expect it to be in the range of, because last year it has been in the between the range of 18 to 20 percent and uh, the last, uh, the, during the last quarter we also announced the Singapore, uh, we, uh, we are planning to move the regulated markets and uh, to the Singapore as a head, international headquarters. So we expect the, uh, the tax rates uh, not to come down immediately. It will take some time, but it will come over a period of time. So at a consolidated level, it will be uh, equivalent to the, the current uh, the rates what we have now. Thank you. This is Krishnan from Quantum Mutual Fund. I just uh, one uh, 51 products is the OTC. How much of that is the revenue contribution from that? What 15 million? 15 million is it? And I don't understand much of the Australian market. Uh, you've been very kind to give a detailed explanation. Uh, what are the risks you see in that market coming ahead? Five player, three uh, wholesalers, um, price corrections. So it's been always like that for the many years. There's not the three. Uh, the, the three wholesalers control 100% of the market. The top three companies have 75% of the market. So the, it can only change in the pecking order. It's very hard. I mean, why, why wouldn't you, you? You should start wondering why an Indian company which has got the lowest cost of production and has been very successful in UK or in US is not in Australia. It's because of all the other dynamics which Dennis articulated. So the risks are will there be more aggressive PBS would there be uh, I mean quality uh, the TGA is as stringent as uh, the US FDA or more so all of those things obviously are risks that one carries in any, any business for any market no, thank you so we we'll, we'll just have the last two questions if there are, there are any yeah any other questions? If there are no other questions, then we will uh, wrap up the session. So there is, there is one question here. You know, in Australia, whenever uh, PBS has uh, led to price decrease by the, by the, to the pharmacy, what has been the behavior in turn to the generic guys? I mean, they have, they, they have very high margins, but at, at that point for that product, what has been the experience, if you can guide us, that will help? There have been, I think the generic players have done a, a very clever thing about that. So what they have done is they've associated any further reduction in price with an increase in volume. So what, what has happened with PBS reforms, the, the generic companies have uh, largely said to, to pharmacists, if you want to see some further price reduction, you have to go from 50% substitution to 70% substitution or 80% substitution. So the net value of their gross profit has, has, has increased, even though the, the, the individual gross profit might have slightly adjusted. So it's, it's been very much a factor that's driven a significant increase in volume and, and at the end of the day, the, the total value that uh, generic companies have, have realised from this. Thank you. Very helpful. Sir. 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 A couple of questions. Uh, first is, can you, can you elaborate please, on the... Can you please introduce yourself? Sorry? Can you please introduce Yeah, yourself? it's uh, Anand. Uh, I'm an independent investor. A uh, couple of questions from my side. First, if you could elaborate on the biotech business. We are spending some capital on R&D there. If you could throw some light when can it turn profitable in the medium term and secondly if you can give some data on the uh, effective tax rate that you are expecting for financial year 16 and 17 
Well, on the tax, Mr. my colleague Badri just explained to you that you expect the tax rates to be at the same levels as it is in the current year, in the last year. So there's no change. We don't anticipate any change in the tax rates. We expect the tax rates to come down over a period of time when we achieve a lot more success with having shifted our international headquarters to Singapore. So we don't have a change in guidance on tax for next this financial year. Um, in terms of biotech, uh, we have already announced that we will spend $125 million on a biotech venture. It's capitalized uh, significantly, $75 million is already capitalized. Uh, and with the recent uh, fundraise from GMS Holdings, uh, subject to FIPP approvals, we are almost fully funded for the project. So we will not be requiring any more cash. There's enough money in the business that has been kept aside uh, for the biotech uh, investments. Um, so that's, and our R&D spends will increase dramatically in the next couple of years on R&D. But uh, I'm talking more on the profit side of the things. How, how, what so do you we, we, don't, we are not going to see one dollar till 2019. So oh. Okay, it's too fine. early to talk about. Profit. Yeah, okay, thank you. Great, so that will be the uh, last question if there, is, there aren't any last questions. Okay, there's one last question here. Hi, this is Uncle from Axis Capital. So my question is, what is your estimated forecast of the top line and the bottom line of the consolidated entity in 16 and 17? We don't give any forecast. No. We don't do as a policy, we don't talk products, we don't guide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.